Chile's president-elect Gabriel Boric has called on Congress to expedite the approval of a pardon bill for the political prisoners detained in the major anti-government protests of 2019. The head of the World Health Organization's Europe region said that more than half of people in the continent are on track to contract the Omicron coronavirus in the next two months. Kazakhstan's president, Kasim Jamat Tokayev, announced the withdrawal of peacekeeping troops of the Security Treaty Organization given the restoration of order in the country. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Chile, where President elect Gabriel Boric called on Congress to expedite the approval of a pardon bill for the political prisoners detained in the major anti government protests of 2019. Boric stated that the best possible agreement is being pursued and noted that just two votes are required from right wing senators in order to secure its approval. The president elect stressed that his government is committed to establishing a broad dialogue with all sectors in order to find unity and avoid tensions and divisions. Boric emphatically called on senators to resolve the issue of the ongoing detention of mainly youths during the month of January, stressing it cannot wait any longer. Argentine President Alberto Fernandez announced that the International Monetary Fund intends to impose an economic adjustment program on the country, which his government will not accept. In an interview with a local radio station, the head of state stressed that his government remains firm in the search for an agreement with the IMF that is beneficial to Argentina, while also ruling out the possibility of the country falling into default in the payment of the debt, at least for now. However, Fernandez denounced that the International Financial Organization continues to seek to impose a program with more structural adjustments, which will compromise economic growth and further harm the population. The IMF agreed to a request for a record loan of more than $50 million from the previous administration of Mauricio Macri, while the current government has continued to seek a renegotiation of the deal. The trial against the former de facto president Janine Agnes and nine others accused of being behind the coup perpetrated in Bolivia in 2019 will begin shortly. According to the Deputy Minister of Justice, the order to open the trial will be issued on Wednesday and in accordance with criminal procedure, the oral and public stage of the process will begin within 45 days. The case surrounds the responsibility of Agnes for the previous measures she took as a senator before the constitutional disruption of 2019, including the crimes of breach of duties and resolutions contrary to the political constitution of the state and the laws. The Bolivian Public Prosecutor's Office is demanding a 10-year prison sentence for the coup plotting leader. In the Dominican Republic, teachers and education sector workers rejected the assumption of face-to-face -face classes amid high levels of COVID-19 infection. Several teachers' unions pointed out that the measure announced by the government does not take into account the fifth wave of coronavirus infections in the country. Teachers' groups are demanding the authorities suspend the first four-month term of the year due to lack of adequate biosecurity measures for the attendance of children and young people at educational institutions. They also called on the Ministry of Education to implement a plan so that all students can have access to education remotely. Cuban President Miguel Díaz Canel denounced the human rights violations committed at the Guantanamo prison on the 20th anniversary of its establishment on the Cuban territory illegally occupied by the United States. The Cuban head of state condemned the constant violations and abuses committed at the military base that Washington maintains on the eastern part of the island, despite constant demands for the return of the territory. Two decades after the first detainees arrived at Guantanamo Bay, a group of United Nations experts urged the U.S. to finally close the site that has seen unrelenting human rights violations, which they say is a stain on Washington's stated commitment to the rule of law. The experts also called on the U.S. government to return detainees home or to safe third countries and to provide remedy and reparation for their torture and arbitrary detention. Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega was inaugurated for a fourth consecutive term in office on Monday. President Ortega secured a landslide victory in the November 7th general elections with more than 76% of the vote. The ruling Sandinista National Liberation Front also secured another landslide victory in November, increasing its parliamentary majority. The swearing ceremony this Monday took place in Revolution Square, northwest of the capital, Managua. Delegations from at least 21 countries, including heads of state and foreign ministers, attended.
And precisely on the day of President Daniel Ortega's inauguration, the United States announced new sanctions against six Nicaraguan officials based on trumped up accusations of state acts of violence, disinformation and targeting of independent media. The US Treasury sanctions targeted the Minister of Defense, as well as officials of the military, the company overseeing telecommunications and postal services and the state-owned Nicaraguan mining company. Peru's world-famous tourist landmark of Machu Picchu expects to receive more than one million visitors this year. According to forecasts by Peru's Ministry of Culture, the historical site will see a significant rise in the number of visitors compared to last year. Authorities reported that Machu Picchu received over 400,000 visitors during 2021, despite being closed in February due to restrictions imposed in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. The archaeological site functioned as an administrative, political and religious centre of the Inca civilization due to its strategic location, which allowed them to control the high Andean and Amazonian zones in the 15th and 16th centuries. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In a press conference, the head of the World Health Organization's Europe region said that more than half of people in the continent are on track to contract the Omicron coronavirus variant in the next two months if infections continue at the current rates. At this rate, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation forecasts that more than 50% of the population in the region will be infected with Omicron in the next six to eight weeks. 50 of the 50 countries in Europe and Central Asia have now reported cases of Omicron. It is quickly becoming the dominant virus in Western Europe and is now spreading into the Balkans. A Chinese city in lockdown has collected more than 1 million samples in a mass coronavirus testing operation as it battles the Delta variant. Yusu, a city in central China, reported 74 confirmed cases on Monday, pushing the total number of infections to 234 in the space of a few days. The figures are tiny compared to just about anywhere else in the world, but, but China maintains its highly successful zero-tolerance policy towards this virus, implementing strict measures whenever an outbreak is detected. The city has completed seven rounds of mass testing and started an eighth round Tuesday morning in certain areas. Daily necessities are being taken to residents' homes in order to ensure that they do not have to go out. Meanwhile, another 13 million people are locked down in the city of Xi'an and 5.5 million in Anyang, while restrictions have been imposed on the port city of Tianxin, only about an hour from the capital. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida Adena announced on Tuesday that borders will remain closed to most foreign nationals until the end of February, as the country sees a surge in COVID-19 cases. The PM stated that strict border controls had helped fend off the Omicron variant. At the same time, Japanese authorities are moving to push booster shots as the government plans to set up large-scale vaccination centers to help support the campaign. Okinawa, Ahiyamaguchi and Hiroshima prefectures have gone into a quasi-state of emergency due to COVID-19 surges. The difference in the infectious status of Omicron variant inside and outside the country is clear. And while taking necessary measures from the viewpoint of humanitarian and national interests, we will maintain the current framework of border measures until the end of February. From March onward, we will utilize the Moderna vaccines that we have secured this time for 18 million people to move forward for the general public. The national government will support the efforts of local governments, such as setting up a large-scale vaccination center by the self-defense forces. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador announced on Monday that he tested positive for COVID-19 for the second time. The Mexican head of state took to Twitter to announce his health condition, noting that he's only showing mild symptoms and currently under isolation, working from home. The president is one of the few world leaders to officially be infected twice. He previously contracted the virus almost a year ago in late January 2021. Interior Minister Adán Augusto López will take over the president's daily press briefings until his full recovery.
Argentine government authorities issued alerts in several provinces on Tuesday following the heat wave sweeping the South American country. The National Meteorological Service reported that the north of the province of Mendoza is under a red alert given the very high risk to health posed by the forecast extreme temperatures, while most of the rest of the country's provinces remain under orange and yellow alerts. Record temperatures are expected to continue. Most of the country is experiencing the record heat, with maximum temperatures reaching 42 degrees Celsius. Heavy rains and flooding in northern states of Brazil have resulted in at least 26 deaths, while 60,000 people have lost their homes. Floodwaters have receded in Bahia, but the forecasts for heavy rain over the next five days continue in the centre and south of the state of Minas Gerais, as well as the greater Belo Horizonte region. 166 municipalities have been declared in a state of emergency, while over 500 people have been injured and at least two remain missing. A fire destroyed at least 100 houses located in the northern Chilean city of Iquique. Municipal authorities reported that there were no injuries or fatalities, although at least 400 people were affected. The local fire station informed that the gigantic fire that had been raging since Monday afternoon in a massive slum had been brought under control. Authorities said the makeshift nature and concentration of the homes in the poor neighbourhood had made fighting the blaze more difficult. In addition, emergency teams had difficulty in accessing water due to the lack of basic infrastructure in the slum, which delayed the containment of the fire. More than 1,800 asylum seekers died or went missing in the Mediterranean Sea in 2021. The figure was provided by European organisations that monitor human rights compliance. According to the institutions, the number of migrants dead or missing in the Mediterranean last year was 20% higher than recorded in 2020. Researchers point out that strict European anti-migration policies favour the increase in deaths in the Mediterranean and announce that many nations of the continent return asylum seekers to their countries of origin, regardless of the dangers faced there. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Tuesday, Kazakhstan's President Kasim Jamal Tokayev announced the withdrawal of peacekeeping troops from the Collective Security Treaty Organization, given the restoration of order in the country. The military contingent arrived in the Central Asian nation last week following a request from the Kazakh president in the face of violent destabilization attempts and foreign-backed acts of terrorism. Tokayev said the troops would withdraw within the next 10 days. The president explained that the acute phase of the counter-terrorist operation had been completed and the situation in all regions is stable, thus declaring the main mission of the CSTO peacekeeping forces to have been successfully completed. And the Kazakh parliament on Tuesday approved the appointment of Ali Khan Smailov, aged 49, as the country's new prime minister, a post he was nominated for by President Kasim Jomak Tokayev. Smailov took over as acting prime minister on January 5th amid the violent unrest that, took, that shook the country and led to the dismissal of the full cabinet headed by Askar Mamin, under whom he served as deputy prime minister. The Five Nation Organization of Turkic States, of which Kazakhstan is a member, held an extraordinary meeting on Tuesday via video conference to discuss the situation in the member state. The Turkish Foreign Minister said his nation was ready to mobilize all of its means to help Kazakhstan. We, as a Turkish state, stand by Kazakhstan. We fully support Kazakhstan for the re-establishment of stability in the country. Peace and stability in Kazakhstan is not only important for our region and our organization, but for global peace, Kazakhstan has the ability, experience and state tradition to overcome this crisis. From now on, we stand by Kazakhstan with all our means and we are ready to mobilize all our means. At the invitation of Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, the Turkish and Iranian Foreign Ministers will pay visits to China on January 12th and 14th respectively, as announced this Tuesday. State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi we hold talks with Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu and have in-depth exchanges of views on bilateral relations and international and regional issues of common concern. 
In recent years, China and Turkey have maintained high-level exchanges and communication at all levels and achieved fruitful results in practical cooperations in various fields. State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi will hold talks with Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullayah. China and Iran enjoy profound traditional friendship. Under the leadership of the two heads of state, China-Iran relations have achieved remarkable development in recent years. The two sides have firmly supported each other on issues concerning each other's core interests, steadily promoted practical cooperation in various fields, and maintained close communication and coordination in international and regional affairs. Chinese and Russian authorities have expressed the intention to deepen the strategic cooperation between their two nations this year. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov held a telephone conversation in which they called for cooperation and joint efforts to protect the legitimate rights and interests of both sides and maintain regional peace and stability. The top diplomats stressed that Beijing and Moscow should deepen coordination and cooperation to counteract the presence of external forces meddling in the internal affairs of Central Asian countries, highlighting the recent events in Kazakhstan. They expressed the commitment to preventing so-called color revolutions in the region and Western attempts to spread chaos. According to the Palestinian Prisoner Society, a local NGO advocating for prisoners' rights, there are currently more than 4,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails, including at least 600 sick inmates. Most are imprisoned following trials in Israeli military courts, which do not meet the minimum requirements of fairness as required by international law or the legal norms practiced in even nominally democratic countries. In addition, there are some 500 Palestinians being held without trial or due process in an internationally condemned practice known in Israel as administrative detention. The struggle for freedom by Palestine's political prisoners, including through the use of hunger strikes, is a cause that unites Palestinians from different factions. Mali's military leader, Asimi Goita, stated that he remains open to dialogue with the economic community of West African states after the bloc imposed sanctions on Bamako over delayed elections. In a sharp escalation after months of simmering diplomatic tensions, leaders from the bloc on Sunday agreed to close borders with the Sahel state and impose a trade embargo. The West African bloc also agreed to cut financial aid, freeze Mali's assets at the Central Bank of West African states, and to recall their ambassadors from the country. The coordinated action followed a proposal by Mali's military government last month to stay in power for up to five years before staging elections, despite international demands that it respect a promise to hold elections in February. The man accused of setting a fire that destroyed parts of South Africa's historic parliament complex faced a new charge of terrorism. Sandy Lee Maffey, aged 49, appeared on Tuesday in a courtroom in Cape Town for a bail hearing when the new charge was added. Maffey was charged with housebreaking with intent to steal, theft, two counts of arson and possession of an explosive device when he appeared in court for the first time last week. The parliament complex was ravaged by the major blaze which started on January 2nd and took firefighters four days to completely extinguish. The 130-year-old complex has been the site of the national legislator since the time of British colonialism in the late 18th century. To our surprise, only this morning, as you heard the council submitting in court, only this morning they added some other charges. And only this morning they revealed it for the very first time that my client was uh, assessed and there is a documentation to that regard. He will have to be referred uh, for mental observation. We heard the court say that as well we are at liberty to refer our client to an independent uh, psychiatrist. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.